the 17th chapter of Acts, uh, verses 16 through 28. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him into the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Praise God for the hearing of these sacred words. Thanks be to God. As we get started this morning, let us pray. Lord Jesus, in these next moments, We ask for the grace that we might be present to you, even as you're here present with us. We pray that you would take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and you would work and move in such a way that they would be made to be acceptable in your sight, for indeed you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Paul Tillich was his name. He was a part of the first wave of really theologians and uh, folks that had to flee Nazi Germany in 1933 because of his beliefs. He ended up coming here to the United States. He became a professor at Union Seminary, and he once said this. All he needed to know about a person was whom or what they worshipped. Now, that might seem a bit of an overstatement, but what Tillich was saying is that that which we worship, that which we give our hearts to, it forms and it shapes the people we become. And so the question becomes then, whom or what do we worship? Over the years, I've been given a number of different strategies on how we can figure that out. I once heard it said that If you really want to know what you want, what you worship, then do an inventory of your life. Uh, Think about where you're invested. Where do we put our time? Where do we invest our talents? Where do we put our treasure? That's ultimately what we worship. And of course, Jesus alluded to this when he said, where your treasure is, your heart there is also. Another way we can figure out what we worship, I've heard it said, is by keeping track of our emotions. Our emotions, in many ways, teach us the truth about who we are. What do we become emotional about? Our emotions tell us what we really 
value. While I can see the merit in both of these approaches, I'm going to offer a third option today. Think about who you, you want to become. As you think about what you worship, let's go a different direction. Think about who you want to become. How do you want to be remembered? What is your legacy going to be? Today we are beginning a series on this idea of worship. And this idea of worship, again, it's very simple. Worship is the communal and individual acts of ritual that form and shape the people we become. And so I ask that question, who do you want to become? What is your legacy? What's my legacy? How do I want to be remembered? And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be going through the ins and outs of worship and how it forms and shapes the people we become. But not only that, it forms and shapes the way we see the world. In this first session, if you will, this first talk I'm going to give on worship, if you will, originally I thought I was going to talk about the name of God. It becomes important when we talk about worship to, to name our God. But let's be honest, we have to go a little bit further than that. It's not enough just for us to name our God. The real question is, what is the shape of our God? We have to get underneath the label and ask ourselves, what is the character of the God in which we give ourselves to? Because it is the character of the God that we give ourselves to that forms and it shapes our character. In our lesson today, we are given really four different shapes of God, and they all lead to really four different outcomes. Our lesson today comes from Acts chapter 17. And we're told that Paul is in Athens. And Athens in those days was like a, a melting pot of culture and ideas and philosophies. There was all kinds of different religions running around. And so Athens was a happening place in those days. We we're told that Paul, as he walks around, but what does he see? He sees a whole bunch of idols. And he begins to become distressed because he sees all these different idols around Athens. Now, here's the thing. Our world is much different than Paul's world. We don't have little stone idols laying around wherever we go. But idolatry? Idolatry is alive and well in our world today. I had a professor who once said it well. An idol is that which lives above question within our hearts. An idol is that which is set into stone. We know we have come up against someone's idol when we pose a question and we go off the deep end because that idol has been questioned. Now, with that in mind, I would argue we have a lot of idolatry today, and why? because a lot of us are walking around on eggshells worried to ask any questions about anything for fear that we're going to, quite frankly, tick someone off. It's a, here it is, distressing situation. And so what does Paul do? He does the courageous thing. He begins to ask questions about the idols that live above question in our lesson today. The first place he goes is to his Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, every time I hear Paul, or anyone else in the New Testament for that matter, going to the Jewish brothers and, and the Jew, our Jewish brothers and sisters, or his Jewish brothers and sisters, and asking questions, I always get nervous. And the reason why I always get nervous is because if we're not careful, we, we go down the path of anti-Semitism. What I think Paul is asking here when he addresses his Jewish brothers and sisters this, is this. He is questioning really a form of religion that can exist wherever religion is practiced. And this form of religion is certainly very much alive and well in Christianity today. And what is this religion I believe Paul is questioning here in our lesson? It's religion that is based upon the performance principle. We have to 
measure up, meet expectations. In Paul's words, it's religion based upon the law of sin and death, always trying to measure up. And certainly that lends itself to a certain way of life, doesn't it? If we're always trying to measure up, what do we become? Judgmental. Competitive. Comparing ourselves with others. Next, Paul addresses the Epicureans. Who are the Epicureans? Well, they were the ancient form of atheists. The Epicureans believed that the world just kind of came together by chance. It just happened. Their philosophy basically was seek pleasure, avoid pain. That's the best that you can do. Their mantra is eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. And the way that the Epicureans lived this out was they removed themselves from the political life of their time. They didn't get all tied up with the culture stuff that was going on. And they just kind of did their own thing, separated from everything else. While the, the first group was very religious, the Epicurean approach kind of lended itself to a self-centered focus. But third, there's the Stoics which was the big philosophical school of the time. And the Stoics were pantheists. The word pan means all. The word theist is the Greek word for God. The Stoics believed all is God. Their mantra was, accept the things you cannot change and change the things you can. And their philosophy, well, it led them to a kind of like fatalism where they were like, that's just the way the universe made it happen. It was particularly favorable to those that had privilege. It's not our fault. The gods made it happen. Finally, Paul presents the Christian alternative to all of this. Technically speaking, what Paul presents in our lesson today is called pan in theism. It's not that all is God, it's that God is in all, but above all at the same time, and is working in a Christ-like way. And why does he believe this? Because he claims that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, I just threw a lot at you, and I can tell by the look on your faces, you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so let's just play a game with these four different schools of thought. And it's called Name That Shape. So you ready to play a game with me? Here we go. I know, you need a little bit of fun in your life, so here we go. The first school of thought was the one that lived under the tyranny of the performance principle. It's religion that's based upon measuring up. What's the shape that comes to your mind when you think of that philosophy in God? Anyone? A ruler. When you're all about measuring up, right? You're interested in making others people measure up to your standard as well. The second school of thought I talked about was the Epicureans. The Epicure Epicureans were like the, the ancient form of atheists. They believed the world just happened by chance, and their mantra was basically seek pleasure, avoid pain at all costs. What image comes to your mind? My image that I came up with was, is marbles. We're sort of like marbles, and the best as we can do is to make sure we don't run into other marbles in the world in which we live in. The third school of thought was the Stoics. When you think about the Stoics, what's the image that comes to your mind? The Stoics, remembered, believe, you remember, believed all is God. And it's sort of like this ancient form of fatalism. What's the image? The image that came to my mind is it's sort of like a clock. God wound up the clock. It runs like a machine. We are where we are in this life. And here's the catch. When your time is up, your time is up. And there's not a darn thing you can do about it. The final image. 
the one that comes to my mind when I think of Paul is a fidget spinner. You know what these things are? <laughs> They're for anxiety, you spin them. Or if the kids get them, if Maggie would have gave out fidget spinners, you know what they would have done with them. They would have became like karate stars, and maybe you fives would have got a fidget spinner before the, the time together in the front was over with, with the children's moment. I believe Paul's concept with God can be compared to like a fidget spinner. God is the, the creator of all that is, Father. God is a son that came to walk with us, Jesus. And God is a Holy Spirit that lives within us all, Spirit. And the image that comes to my mind is a, it's a fidget spinner. There's Father, there's Son, there's Spirit. And here's the catch. When you spin them, when you spin it, it goes so quickly, you can't even tell the difference. And that is Paul's image of God. It's a God of, quite frankly, outgoing love. And what does this tell us about God? Well, God's not like an object that we hold on to as much as like it's a, it's a flow that we enter into as we give ourselves to love. And so, which is the right option becomes the question. And I'm going to go on a limb here and say this. I don't think we can absolutely know with absolute certainty. The moment that we think that faith is about certainty, here's the catch. It becomes an idol. A form of something we, we force other people to measure up to, and so we have to be humble about all this faith stuff. I love the way that Soren Kierkegaard said it. He defined faith as risk with direction and worship as a search for that which is worthy of our finitude. And now I know that's lofty and that's philosophical, but what is Kierkegaard saying in this moment? He's saying what we all know, folks. Deep down, our time here is limited. And we better darn well think about where we're going to invest our lives and ask ourselves, who, who do we deep down want to become? Do we want to walk around like the ruler, making everyone measure up to us? Do we want to be a people that are simply all about our own personal pleasure and we avoid pain? Do we want to be those folks that just say, well, it's not my problem, it's not my fault, I'm not going to get involved? Or do we want to be a people that is invested in risking ourselves for Christian love? Christian love is what this thing called worship is all about. This whole ritual is meant to point us in the direction of love. From the, the ushers and the greeters that say, good morning, it's good to see you. To the, the candles that we carry into the worship space that are meant to remind us of the, the fire, of the power of God's love. To the offering that we give every Sunday morning that we say, I'm gonna give myself over I'm going to share myself to the, the children's moment up here where we say that the children are welcome here in this space. Even the fact that we stand for the gospel lesson, it's meant to tell us something. That there are, are some things that should be honored above other things. In this case, we honor Christ-like love. And week after week, and year after year, the reason why we come to a, a time such as this, a place such as this, is because we have decided that we want to give ourselves over to that sort of love. And if we don't become that sort of love, quite frankly, we've missed the point of worship. I love the way that my colleague and friend, Pastor Steve Butler, put it. 
As a couple weeks ago, someone texted us a video of my daughter Paige's baptism. It happened nine years ago. I cannot believe it's been nine years, but Paige's baptism happened in this space nine years ago. My grandfather was here. My dad was here. My brother was here. Many of you were here. And we all stood around the baptismal font. And after the baptism was over, I walked Paige up and down the aisle. And what I did not know is in the background, Pastor David Warren was videoing the whole thing. And then after the baptism was over, here's what Pastor Steve said. I commend Paige Methodist Temple into your care. Practice your life in such a way that she might know Christian love and that when the time comes, her decision to choose Christian love would be as natural to her as taking her first steps. And that's what this is all about. Being a part of a community so that we choose love and it becomes natural to us. Friends, our time in this world is limited. The challenge as we get started in this series today is choose your shape of God wisely. Think about the person that you want to become. Think about the people we want to be. And what makes us Christian is when we look to Jesus, we think to ourselves, that's the person. That's the one I want to be. In an effort to kick off the sermon series today, I'm going to do a remembrance of baptism ceremony. And so what we do when we remember our baptism is we're not getting baptized, but basically we're saying, yeah, I want to commit myself to that path again. I want to rededicate my, my life to the path of Christ. And so this morning as we get ready to sing our our closing hymn, what you're going to be invited to do is come forward. Pastor Randy or I will take some water, put it on your forehead, and simply say, remember your baptism and be faithful. By standing up and, and coming forward, you're saying, yeah, this is, this is what I want to commit my life to. If you're worshiping online, here's what I would suggest you do. After you wash your hands at some point this week or even today, um, take the water from your hands and place it on your forehead and say, I remember, I remember who I am and, and who I want to be. And so if you'd like to do that today as we get ready to sing our closing hymn, you're invited to come forward and we'll remember our baptisms together. Let us stand and we'll sing our closing hymn now.